What do you see when you imagine the future? When we picture what's to come, we often think of innovations that take us to new heights. Some of them are already here, and every day, thousands more make the jump from our imagination into reality. Nowhere is this more evident than here in Japan. Fourth Industrial Revolution technologies are fundamentally transforming the way we do things. All this is happening so fast, and we must do more than just keep up. These emerging technologies open up boundless possibilities of what our future could look like. Technology is not a simple solution to our problems. It poses questions that we need to answer and guidelines we need to write together. That's why we're all here. A global event hosted by Japan that brings together the world's leading voices across disciplines and geographies. How technology will shape our tomorrow depends on the choices we make today. And that starts now. Hello everyone, my name is Arjun Kapil and I'm a senior technology correspondent at CNBC based in Guangzhou, China. Welcome to everyone watching around the world. Uh, this session is called Digital Payments, Realizing the Vision. Now, we all know that COVID-19 has really accelerated some of those digital trends we've been talking about over the past few years. And one of those is digital payments. And I'm sat here in China where digital payments are everywhere, but how do they work cross-border? How can they drive financial inclusion? And what are some of the challenges that remain in the space? These are the questions I want to tackle with our fantastic panel today. And for those of you watching, wherever you are, if you have any questions for our panelists, please write them via the chat function and we'll get to them at the end of the session. Now, to bring in my fantastic panel, I just would like to introduce them. Firstly, Mr. Rioza Hamino, the commissioner of the Financial Services Agency, of Japan, Ms. Ian Hoffman, the CEO of IDB Lab, Demetrius Morantis, Head of Gov uh, Global Government Engagement at Visa, and Professor Longchen, Director of the Lohan Academy. Now, just would like to kick off the conversation talking about digital payments and what some of the challenges and solutions are. Now, Ian, I'd like to kick off with you because in a conversation we had before, um, you know, you told, you said that there's a digital emergency as it relates to access to finance. So what did you mean by that? What are the challenges that need to be overcome to solve it? Um, well, thank you so much, Arjun, and, and thank you to the colleagues at, at the web for, for this invitation. And, um, um, by digital emergency, what we, uh, what we see is that, um, of course, as everywhere else in the world, uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean, um, in parallel with the massive loss of GDP, like close to 8% of loss of GDP, 26 million jobs lost, there has also been a big acceleration of um, digital models and digital forms of doing things, um, from education to health to payments. Um, and, and that started primarily because a lot of the population uh, from the beginning of the pandemic in many of the countries, 14 to be precise of the 26 countries in Latin America, offer cash transfers to its citizens, uh, 14 of those countries using digital payment modes. And so all of a sudden you had 50 new people in Brazil, 5 million people more in Colombia that for the first time in their lives had a bank account and it was a digital account. So we want to take advantage of that to go from that to a much more fully inclusive financial model uh, that is not just a one of cash transfer. So there's a massive opportunity, uh, but it has to come with a, with a, with a bundle of, um, um, of measures and that go from connectivity, interoperability, and adding many more services than just this one of cash transfer. And uh, on that point, Dimitris, I'll come to you because Irene, they mentioned interoper interoperability. It's a point uh, that you've been focused on. First, help us quickly understand what exactly that means uh, and what the challenges and potential solutions are for that. Thank you, Arjun. Um, and thanks to WEF and the government of Japan for putting this on. I wish we were all there in Tokyo instead of being beamed in. Um, look, Irena said it perfectly. Um, when we think about digital payments and we think about electronic commerce, we have to put it into co the context, which is it's really a flywheel for economic empowerment. 
Um, digital payments, cross-border e-commerce is enabling uh, small businesses that have never been able to participate in global commerce now suddenly to see new opportunities all over the world. There has been a 19% growth in, in global um, uh, e-commerce between uh, 2019 and 2020. Um, and the pandemic has just only underscored the importance of being able to be digital for small businesses. Those that ha have had digital con connectivity have been the, the ones that are the most able to recover from um, the ravages of the pandemic. Those who have not have had the most challenge. And so being digitally enabled, being able to accept digitally pa digital payments, being connected to a digital financial ecosystem um, is really become more and more critical. Where does in interoperability come, come in? In order to make the digital ecosystem flourish, things need to be interoperable. You can't live in a world where there's you know, one standard, one system, one payment scheme, uh, one network. You need to be able to inter interoperate with, with everyone. And so when I think about interoperability, I think of it as being something that's applicable to networks, something that's applicable to standards, and something that's applicable to regulations. And if we can create an interoperable ecosystem that allows you know, a thousand flowers to bloom, you're just providing more opportunities for small businesses and others that can really see and rely on a digital link ecosystem um, for their economic recovery, for their economic empowerment, and for their economic success. Thanks, Dimitrios and Irene for laying that out because these are topics definitely want to dig into a bit further around regulation in particular and some of the technologies around that. But first, let me just come to Professor Long Chen first because you know, you've had the experience in China uh, at Ant Group with Alipay, one of the biggest mobile uh, and digital payments providers in China. What you see Chinese market you think uh, that could work around the world when it comes to addressing some of these challenges and, and, uh, and issues? Uh, so uh, firstly, I would like to talk about uh, some of the value of, values of uh, uh, digital payment as you can see from China's experience. Uh, so I think that firstly, it means unprecedented opportunities. Uh, in a, a typical uh, e-commerce platform in China, now you have hundreds of millions of consumers online to do shopping, and you have tens of millions at, of SMEs that can serve them. So now a uh, uh, small uh, store, uh, it used to be restricted by the uh, space and time. Now they can serve uh, customers thousands of kilometers away. The average distance between the buyers and sellers is about a thousand kilometers in China. And so that means unprecedented opportunities for uh, SMEs that were um, only available to big companies before. I think the third, second thing you can see is that digital payment, it means uh, the information of real economic activity that could be observed and recorded. That, all, that means the KYC, know your customer. It helps the uh, uh, merchants to serve the customers well. It also means that the customers can get financial services. So as a, one example, in the past several years, my bank has served more than 20 million SMEs. Half of the entrepreneurs are women, and they use this so-called 310 exam, uh, uh, model. It takes three minutes to apply, one second to get the funding and the zero personnel interference. Using my friend, Nobel Prize winner, uh, uh, Ben Holmstrom's words, uh, uh, information is the new classroom. And digital payment is a powerful tool to supply that. Now, let me give you a third example to see the, to see the value of the, of the digital payment. Uh, it is that the, it could be a very powerful tool to promote sustainability, green finance. Uh, so in, uh, we'll give one example from Alipay. Uh, so in Alipay, actually, we have this, some, some, this tool is called the Art Forest. So essentially, every day, the, the, when the, uh, the users, uh, they, they involve into the carbon redux reduction activities, it could be uh, recorded. It's upon their uh, uh, approval. It could be 
uh, traced and uh, uh, recorded, and they're going to see a little green energy. If they collect the energy, or they can collect it from each other from their friends, a little green tree will, will grow on um, Alipay's platform. And then this, uh, if this uh, virtual tree grows into full, the uh, real tree will be planted in the deserted uh, desertification areas in China. So in the past several years, actually more than 550 million users have uh, have adopted this program, and more than 100, uh, 220 million real trees were planted, and more than 12 million tons of the carbons were adopted. So my point here is to use this example to show that payment is it means unprecedented opportunity and uh, inclusion. It also means that. Uh, uh, it, it, it is a powerful tool uh, for, to, because it means connectivity. And, and information it also means uh, uh, availability of inclusive finance and for a lot of additional in innovations, including the system ability. Uh, so that's some of the things we learned from China. But I think one key thing here is that uh, we need to have the public and private uh, collaboration to do this. Uh, domestically, I think the it is very important for the governments to have the right uh, uh, environment to help to promote the infrastructure for digital uh, uh, facilities. And it also has the right uh, uh, encouraging environment for the policy. And then in the meantime, it allows the market participants to, to uh, transform the real economic activities into the uh, uh, using the digital payment. Uh, internationally, I really uh, support the Dimitri's point that we need a lot of the uh, uh, interoperability. Let me stop here. And yeah, we'll dig into that a little bit more. Well, I, I want to get the view uh, from sort of the, the country level with Commissioner Amino for a moment. Uh, talking about digital payments in Japan, how is the FSA and the broader government thinking about digital payments in Japan? Because you know, Japanese consumers are still very heavily reliant on cash. So, so what is the strategy to push forward with digital payments? Uh, um, well, um, we've been changing the regulatory environment. For example, last year, we uh, introduced uh, new three categories for non-bank payment services providers so that the regulatory requirement would be proportionate to the risk they entail. So we are amending our regulation all the time to facilitate the transition into a digital payment. Uh, the latest news is that uh, the Bank of Japan has entered into the uh, proof of con concept stage in their uh, central bank digital currency project. Um, and uh, more broadly, we, the government would establish a new agency which would coordinate throughout the uh, government to transform uh, the whole society to make the digitalization and transformation. And uh, that would create a further better uh, environment to move forward with um, uh, digital payment. Uh, that is our current situation. And uh, as uh, Demetrius uh, mentioned, uh, with regard to digital payments, there are 100 uh, flowers uh, blossoming, but uh, also there is um, a move toward um, higher interoperability. For example, for small amount payment, uh, there is a plan to create a, a single layer of uh, common infrastructure and another layer of um, individual uh, payment services and to connect them, the two layers with APIs to attain uh, competition among uh, diverse models of payment. At the same time, attain uh, interoperability the framework will be in operation next year. So many things going on to move toward uh, digitalized payment. Right, let's, let's dig into then, we've been talking about public-private partnerships, we've been talking about interoper interoperability. So let me just uh, go back to Irene. Um, what areas can public and private sectors work together on and what would you like to see from policymakers when it comes to, to the regulatory point of view? Um, 
Thanks. That, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, is for both to recognize the opportunity. And, and we see that, um, like in other regions, Latin like America and the Caribbean, this is at least a $200 billion opportunity in front of us. Um, we've seen that uh, the highest um, growth in investment uh, in the last 12 months have been in companies that are in the digital payment space. Um, they've attracted more than $4 billion. And you have companies in the region uh, not just the e-commerce uh, companies that have, of course, um, um, grown tremendously like Mercado Libre in, um, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. The, um, it's a $75 billion company now. It's, a, it's the largest market cap uh, company in the, in the region, but also in the payment space. A company is from a market as small as Uruguay, 3.4 million people, like Di Local, is the latest unicorn in Latin America and the Caribbean. So I think First and foremost is to realize that there is a massive opportunity. Um, and then uh, very much um, like uh, uh, Jimeno San said, making sure that we build the right foundations because what we don't want is to transfer the inequalities of the physical world into the digital world. And so we're very focused on that uh, from the Inter-American Development Bank and within that ITB lab as the innovation laboratory with the function of really making sure that we create a, a public good. In this case, what we've done is leveraging blockchain um, through a platform called Lackchain that provides that layer um, that, in, that basically offers a, a free common protocol on, on top of which anyone can then layer use cases. In fact, we've done some with, with web uh, related to customs, but many related also to digital wallets, um, having the essentials in terms of uh, self-sovereign digital identity um, and being able to load credentials and having giving people the chance to really build their own economic passport and, and uh, as um, uh, Professor Chen mentioned, uh, uh, use uh, uh, um, the, 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 the great tool that digital payments provide in terms of being able to um, record and trace economic activity that can then be used to access many more services. Um, so I'd like to um, stop there, but I think the, the, the building these type of partnerships, building this part of these type of platforms, like the example that we have now in Latin America and the Caribbean, which is Lackchain, um, it's an amazing new form of public-private partnership. And, uh, and I, I invite anyone who is interested in learning more to, to contact us. Yeah, that's fascinating. I wonder if that's a model as well. Irina, as you see, it, obviously, you're focused on a specific region of the world, but is that, a, is that a model you see perhaps being able to work in other areas of the world? Definitely. In fact, even um, the World Bank and even with the African Development Bank, um, they are leveraging it because in the end, um, and this is um, a precisely built as an agnostic platform uh, that can be interoperable and open uh, to anybody who wants to build use cases on it. Um, it's been recognized by E2, uh, ITU, um, as one of the leading uh, uh, blockchain uh, ecosystems in the world. And so absolutely, you know, we built it with a public good mentality. Uh, it's there. And, uh, and, now, and now we are seeing 30 of the leading partners around the world, um, each with their own strength in bond issuances in uh, AML and KYC, which uh, Professor Ten mentioned before, um, uh, adding, adding that onto that ecosystem. Um, and uh, and it, it, it can definitely be uh, cross-border and, and enable also cross-border payment with, CD, with Citibank, for example, uh, with whom we are, we've already done a number of, uh, of um, um, uh, use cases on that, including for our own uh, uh, pay, uh, payments across countries at the IDB. And, and Demetrius, for, for you, I mean, you work, of course, and, and our constant communication with governments uh, from a regulatory uh, standpoint, what needs to change? And also when you're speaking to these governments, how are they uh, thinking about private and public partnerships in the digital payment space? There's such an amazing opportunity right now um, for governments and the private sector to work together to really enable this in a way that's never been done before. Commissioner Hamino is, is leading really important work in the context of the Financial Stability Board, where they're looking at 
how to make cross-border payments you know, faster, cheaper, more interoperable. Um, and, and that work is, is critically important. But I think the things that governments should focus on, uh, there, there, are, there are a number of things. One is, and this is fundamental, is to remove barriers to cross-border e-commerce. We're in, unfortunately, an era of economic nationalism. And in the digital sphere, that's translating into things like data localization policies. That's super harmful to cross-border e-commerce. It's super harmful to the ability of, of small businesses, which are the backbone of every single nation's national economy, to be able to start, run, grow, and thrive. Um, and so governments really need to lead the way in whether it's through trade policy or, or otherwise, in concluding agreements that remove barriers to cross-border payments. Japan has been a real leader in this respect during its G20 year when it, it, it worked and, and, and was really pushing the data free flow with trust initiative. Um, you know, in, in the Asia Pacific, uh, Singapore and Australia have it concluded a really just groundbreaking uh, digital economy agreement that does a number of things like prohibit data localization, encourage uh, interoperability. Chile has been a real leader in this space in the Pacific Alliance. So there's a, there are a lot of great initiatives underway um, that really we just need to, to, to push. So that's sort of at the, like the macro government level. Then there is some more sort of micro specific things that could be helpful and these are things that are part of Himino-san's agenda, I believe, which is how do you reduce regulatory complexity? You know, there's a lot of regulatory requirements that, that are just very complicated and it's hard enough for a bank or, or a company like Visa uh, to, to deal with. But imagine if you're a small business and you're trying to have to contend with the panoply of AML requirements around the world, the, the more simple um, the more rational we make those, the more we'll able to promote e-commerce and digital payments. Likewise, on the licensing side, this is a real challenge, particularly for remittances. Singapore and Malaysia are doing a great job, um, you know, trying to really streamline um, licensing procedure, uh, procedures in their remittances corridor. And then I think governments, you know, oftentimes there's a lot of regulatory fragmentation and the more that they can coordinate data policies with each other, the better. You know, we've recently come out in favor of creating an FSB-like entity um, under the G7 um, called the Data and Technology Forum, which would allow, you know, leader level conversations on these very topics so that governments can can you know, move forward on these and coordinate in ways that would allow the innovation in the private sector. And that's the private sector's role in the, in the public-private partnership. We've got to innovate. We've got to create the products and services that are going to help small businesses, that are going to help consumers, that are going to help promote financial inclusion. We have a product at Visa called Visa Direct that completed 3.5 billion transactions in, in 2020 but that was involving 16 card-based networks, 65 domestic ACH schemes, seven faster, faster payment schemes, and five payment gateways. That's interoperability. And if we can foster that through a private-public partnership, we're gonna really make a huge um, uh, headway in, in the goal that we are talking about today, which is how do you use digital trade, digital payments, cross-border e-commerce to help empower small businesses, consumers, and those who need to be empowered. And, and uh, Commissioner Hamino, that Demetrius mentioned Japan uh, from a regulatory standpoint, and what are some of the regulations you're trying to enact around digital payments? And I mean, for your challenge is also balancing regulation with, of course, innovation and promoting innovation. Uh, thank you. Um, since Demetrius mentioned the uh, global effort, let me briefly talk about that uh, as well. And um, uh, the, under the uh, Saudi Arabian G20 presidency, the major achievement is that uh, uh, regulators, central bankers, and the finance ministries around the world committed to attain uh, a faster, cheaper, more transparent, and more uh, inclusive 
uh, cross-border payment and came up with a specific um, uh, roadmap with five areas and the 19 building blocks. And uh, we are implementing it and uh, it covers uh, the elements uh, Dimitrios mentioned. For example, um, we need to address um, cross-border uh, regulatory fragmentation and um, we are reviewing the existing uh, international standards and um, uh, trying to identify any gaps or areas for further alignment. Uh, data is also an important area. Uh, Dimitrius uh, mentioned the de free data free flow with trust. Um, we are also, FSP is also reviewing the regulation uh, together with data authorities um, uh, related to cross-border data flows. We are also talking about the uh, harmonization of money laundering rules and the uh, possibility of uh, shared uh, customer due diligence uh, infrastructures so um, in many areas, um, the work is proceeding. It's not easy, it's an ambitious project, but um, uh, regulators around the world is working uh, at the full speed under the uh, roadmap. And um, uh, Arjun, you mentioned uh, what kind of regulatory challenges um, Japan faces with the payment innovation and how we are trying to deal with it. Um, I suppose the issue is, uh, issues are broadly common across the world. And uh, the fa let me cite three challenges. One is um, the need for agility. Um, JFSA is submitting bills to amend relevant rules almost every year. Uh, that is the first challenge for regulators. The second challenge is to how to define regulatory perimeter. People talk about the need about the activity-based regulation or uh, argue for the principle of uh, same activity, same risk, same regulation. It's good, but um, nobody knows how to do it in specific design or regulation. We need to think about that. And the third one is the issue Japan raised when we were the G20 presidency in 2019. How to deal with permissionless uh, distributed financial technologies. Regulators attend regulatory purpose so far, mainly designating uh, entities to regulate. But um, if there is no central entity uh, masterminding the whole picture, like in the case of uh, Bitcoin, how to design uh, mechanism to attain uh, public purposes. Maybe we need to build uh, some brand new approaches like a, a multi-stakeholder approach as we do in the case of uh, internet. That one is another major area we need to tackle on. Interesting. And, and, and Professor Chen, from your perspective, I mean, China's been going through a big regulatory push over the past few months regarding the fintech space um, around lending, around payments and various other areas um, as well. So, I mean, what kind of regulation do you feel will be helpful in, in being able to push innovation in the digital payment space? Uh, China has been a tremendous beneficiary of uh, the central bank's leadership. So just give you a concrete example. So back in 2004, Alipay was born, but uh, and uh, with other third party non-bank uh, payment uh, 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 institutions. But really it's only after six more years then the central bank started to have the formal uh, regulation uh, rules. Uh, before that, there's a lot of the guidance, it's called uh, market guidance, but really it allows this to flourish. So the result, the end result is really tremendous. I cannot emphasize this enough because it allows for the, for China to transform into a country with more than 1 billion uh, mobile payment users. So what we have learned from this is that I think the government uh, needs to provide the 
the uh, digital infrastructure and the policy environment, encouraging policy environment in the meantime, uh, because there's a lot of resistance from the both the supply and demand side to, to adopt the new uh, digital payment methods. So for that, I think uh, it's very important to allow the market participant to experiment, to come up with uh, uh, a novel uh, solutions to the economic problems uh, that was uh, that was there before. Uh, another point here is that uh, I think is the uh, if we think about how to solve the problems of finance, uh, is the, a couple of problems. One is the uh, information itself. So how do you have the information, uh, have it digitized at very little cost such that then you can do the payment, you can do the inclusive finance. Another part is the uh, trust, trustworthy information. So the information is not trapped by one body. And that is a part the uh, uh, the uh, blockchain can, can help to so resolve a lot. So from our experience, I think a lot can be done just by having the information digitized, having everybody participate in the marketplace. I really share the enthusiasm from the previous speaker, speakers that we should really push for the uh, uh, inter interoperability and the cross-border e-commerce because that, that really helps, especially the SMEs, the average users. From China's experience, the most active users are not the most wealthy people or the biggest companies. Really, they are the SMEs, the average Joes. Uh, they really enjoy this uh, thanks to the, tremendous, the, the very little close to zero cost of the uh, creating and sharing information. All right. Well, we've got look, about 10 minutes left. So I wanted to sort of focus this last part of the chat on technology uh, and technology solutions that could perhaps help us solve some of these problems that we've discussed so far. So Irene, I'll kick off with you. And what are some of the technologies you see helping to, to boost financial inclusion, to solve some of these, uh, these issues around interoperability, for example? Uh, is digital currency something you're interested in? And of course, already you mentioned sort of blockchain-based technologies as well. How do you see it? Um, yeah, um, well, uh, I will talk about technology, but from the point of view of um, what is it for and why and not, um, we, we, we at IDB Lab tend to promote new technologies, but always with a focus on who we're trying to help. And, 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 and what we've seen is, is, again, understanding very, very well what problems we're trying to solve. Uh, still, more than half of, la of the population in Latin America and the Caribbean is unbanked. 20% uh, of the consumers are still pay for e-commerce purchases in cash. Um, and, and so uh, how do you, at the same time, we've seen in the last few months how quickly also habits can change. Um, uh, this is probably the biggest lesson of 2020 is that those habits can change if usability is obvious. Um, and uh, social payments, the social transfer payments I mentioned earlier, e-commerce are just two examples to illustrate it. Now, uh, so that, that's the trend and there's still a massive opportunity and, and gap to be filled. Um, in terms of how and which technologies can be the most useful for it, um, I think those that promote uh, payment infrastructures um, that, um, that are um, uh, interoperable, um, a system that promotes open source where there's no at the moment, there's no single regional settlement mechanism across national clearinghouses. Uh, the interoperability is taking place, as the, the metros rightly said, across systems like Visa, Market Mastercard for retail use. Um, but what we want to see um, is also fintech and traditional players, which could be great enablers of global services integrating their own infrastructures uh, to enable uh, digital payments building channels uh, across countries. Um, and because in this case, fragmentation is a real barrier, um, and this is of course an advantage that, uh, that China had as a massive market with, without that kind of barrier. Um, uh, 
we we need to look for um, a technologies that, that can uh, that can more easily be deployed in an efficient and uh, low cost way and with the user in mind. And one of them, uh, as I mentioned, is indeed blockchain. Um, in terms of the infrastructure and open infrastructure we've built, um, uh, the next layer is indeed um, digital um, uh, fiat currency. Um, we are not uh, going into uh, cryptocurrencies per se, even though five of the 10 countries in the, in the world that use most cryptocurrencies are in Latin America and the Caribbean, and that's not even including Venezuela. But even if uh, we are looking at it more from the perspective of um, a, a digital fiat currency that is integrated in the formal financial system. Great. And, and you mentioned uh, digital fiat currencies there. So I'll just come on to Commissioner Hamino, because you said earlier, of course, uh, the uh, Japanese uh, uh, government's working on a, on a, on a digital uh, Japanese currency. So I'll uh, just lay out the reasons for this, any timeline you could give us as well. And just on that point, do you see digital other digital currencies like Bitcoin being able to coexist alongside a central bank issued digital currency? Uh, thank you, Arjun. Um, uh, of course, the Bank of Japan has started an experiment, but uh, I, so far as I understand, there is no decision uh, or uh, judgment uh, whether it should be used in live or not. It is still um, the stage of um, weighing the benefits and the uh, potential side effects. Uh, and um, well, I'm sure that the future payment would be largely digital, digitized. But uh, how much will the digital be? I have no specific views. Um, one big benefit of um, uh, blockchain-based digital currency is that it can be programmable and uh, work with uh, smart uh, contracts. So, well, if that potential is, is utilized, uh, combining uh, financial and non-financial transaction and uh, payment together, uh, that would create a major opportunity to transform the economy and um, uh, society. And if that happens, maybe uh, blockchain-based um, uh, digital currency could be a, a key central uh, form of currency in the future. But um, uh, many ideas behind uh, Bitcoin is variable. I very much appreciate um, uh, the dream presented by Satoshi Nakamoto. But, um, well, I see no connection between the current big market capitalization. Uh, maybe it is just consuming CO2 to, to, to support um, speculative activities. But uh, I'm sure there will be second and third and fourth generation of um, uh, digital currencies. And uh, I very much... Uh, see major potential in that direction. Thank you. Great. And we've just got a question in from the audience, and I want to address this one to, to, to Professor Chen, because uh, the audience member is asking uh, about the launch of the digital yuan in China, or at least the pilot projects so far, and its implications on the future of digital payments, especially as I think was previously mentioned by Demetrius in an era where you've got a bit of a economic nationalism to some extent, data siloing, and some of these other issues as well? Uh, to, to finance well, I think, as I mentioned, we need uh, both information and trustworthy information. So for information, if you have the information, then you can do the KYC, you can provide the uh, digital service and uh, the financial service, including the lending, those other stuff. So the second part is the it's the uh, shared. Uh, it's the trustworthy part. That is the if you then that part. There are two ways to do it. One is a permission, uh, which means it's the 
uh, permission blockchain, which means that it, the information is shared by the uh, a number of institutions, and that then that can spread the trust. So you do not need to collect information every time. Uh, and then finally, you have the uh, you have the permissionless. Uh, so as the uh, uh, as just being mentioned, that the one big problem of the permissionless the, uh, blockchain is that that uh, that activity has very little connection to the real economy right now. So a huge chunk of the real economy is try to uh, is try to. Uh, to make make the uh, it, it needs to have the information to be digitized and and to such that the financial service is is possible. So that there's uh, there's several ways to serve the. My point here is that there are several ways to serve the um, to, to make the financial service uh, available. Now uh, uh, countries are, are trying to explore the digital uh, uh, the, the fiat uh, uh, digital currencies. I think for that, it has good reasons to do that because it uh, tries to track the economic activity better than uh, it helps, uh, I think, to help the uh, monetary policy. It helps to uh, a lot of the stuff, the policy side of the work can be uh, can be done better. What we have experienced from, uh, from before then, I think, is that uh, the, the market-driven agents uh, uh, with or without the government uh, uh, digital uh, currencies have already done a tremendous job by promoting the financial inclusion uh, in China in all parts of the world. I think the, uh, the the government still they also needs the currency to be uh, uh, digitized because it everyone body wants to do this so that will help the the digitization, uh, the financial inclusion to be to be better, but it's not a, a zero one exclusion. It's really again, it comes down to collaboration between the market and the and the governments to help the the financial service to be more inclusive. Yeah. And, and Demetrius, just from your point of view, when you look at the talk at the moment from central banks around uh, digital uh, currencies. Um, how does that fit into your world? And do you see that being able to solve some of these issues around interoperability or around the uptake of digital payments as well? Yeah, I mean, I think Professor Long just brought up a really important point that we, we haven't really talked a ton about, which is trust. And, you know, at the bottom of, of everything we're talking about with respect to digital payments is trust. And trust comes from making sure that systems are secure and resilient. And that's something, you know, that we have uh, decades of experience on it at, at Visa. And that's where, you know, this whole idea of, of Visa and as a network of networks and, and the whole concept of, of interoperability um, comes in. You know, blockchain is another network. It's another form factor. It's, a, it's like ACH. It's like real-time payments. It's like VisaNet. Um, and if we're able to ensure interoperability amongst all of these different form factors um, in a way that's secure and re resilient, that's how we are best able to ensure financial inclusion. Um, and so with respect to, you know, central bank digital currencies or, or stable coins, I mean, it's something that's, that's really important to us at Visa. We've been working with um, central banks across the globe as they think about um, their own manifestation of a central bank digital currency um, to really help you know shape the thinking and 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 shape how that 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 plays out. Likewise, we've been working with um, um, you know players across the ecosystem on on how to you know realize um, stable coins and how do you you know include them in wallets. How do you allow consumers to purchase um, stable coins? So there is so much going on that's so exciting um, in this space right now. Um, and, you know, at bottom, we just need to make sure that whatever we do ensures that we maintain a secure and resilient financial ecosystem um, that promotes financial inclusion, you know, and allows, as I said earlier in my remarks, a thousand flowers to bloom. Absolutely. Demetrius, thank you so much for that. And I think I certainly learned a lot during the course of this chat, and I hope everyone 
watching it as well. I think it's clear that digital payments are very critical for economic growth, for financial inclusions and lots more advantages to them. But there are some challenges that do remain around things like interoperability, around regulation. But of course, as we've been discussing, lots of technologies coming to the fore, lots of discussions being had on the governmental level to solve some of these things. So certainly an exciting future ahead for this digital payment space. And of course, realizing the vision. I'd just like to thank our wonderful panelists for their thoughts and ideas around this topic. I'm Arjun Karpal from CNBC. And now I'd just like to hand over to Sean Doherty, Head of International Trade and Investment at the World Economic Forum to give some closing remarks. Over to you, Sean. Great. Thank you very much, Arjun. And on behalf of the World Economic Forum, I'd just like to add my thanks to you and all the panelists for really a great conversation. The forum community is working to drive forward public and private cooperation on digital payment. And I think today's discussion has really been a great way to kick off our 2021 focus on interoperability, regulatory reform, and harmonization. So we would very much welcome broad participation Try and help build a more inclusive payments ecosystem. And so I'd encourage uh, the audience to get in touch with our trade team at digitaltrade at weforum.org. But again, thanks to our moderator and our panelists. And please do enjoy the rest of the Global Technology Governance Summit. Thanks all.